And we're live. Welcome to episode six of the Geek Book Club. The club what geeks book out on. Wait, no, that's not. Strike, reverse that. You know what I mean. Uh, coming at you, uh, your once a month, uh, weekly, uh, your once a month, your monthly book podcast. We we put out a book, we read it for a month, we come back, we talk about it. You can join in on the fun, join the live chat. You can hit us up on the Twitters too. Uh, and uh, I am joined as always by my uh, my lovely and delightful co-host, Mr. Andrew Wallace uh, at Fat Produce. Hey, how's it going, Juan? It's going great. This was a busy week for me. I know you were a big part of that too, just doing all kinds of stuff on the internet and uh, having a lot of fun getting some good work done it, while while using uh, the backdrop of uh, the Geek Book Club just to kind of get my downtime in order, uh, reading a very interesting book this month. Um, yes. <laughs> like, well, that That yes was very telling, I feel like. <laughs> We're probably of a similar mind. I, I don't know if we. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to tease our discussion too much. But if you got about, uh, I don't know, into the first third of this book, feeling probably the same kind of anxiousness as to what we were going to talk about <laughs> that I was feeling. Yeah. Whew, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I picked up. So, so what we're reading? What we? Well, we've already read it. Yes, the, we should probably we, introduce the book, and hopefully, yes. some <laughs> folks joined us in picking up a copy of this of this groundbreaking novel. I don't want to take mm -hmm. anything away from how this book should be celebrated, but we are coming at this from a perspective 40 years after when this book was originally published. Well, absolutely. Well, and, and it's noted, this is The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin. And it's it's noted, it's a Hugo and Nebula Award winner as well. Yes. So it's, 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 it's very, it's a very significant work. And Damn. having read it, I still fully endorse and fully believe it, uh, it. It is more than deserving of attention, accolade, and reward. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, and and the I guess uh, here I will kind of go a little uh, paraphrase the 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 what we have on the back of this. You know, so it takes place in the planet Winter, where there is no gender. The Gathenians can become a male or female during each mating cycle. Uh, as what they call Kemmer. And this it's something that, you know, humans just find incomprehensible. Well, the Ekumen of Gnome Worlds, a.k.a. what I call the Federation, uh, <laughs> are sent the, has sent an ethno, ethnologist to uh, to study them and to try and get them to join to join the, the Ekumen, essentially the Federation. I'm going I'm to call it the Federation. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, but essentially so that they can become part of a greater spacefaring society. Right. And, and it's not, it's not a super large society either. It's, it's a <clears> handful <throat> of worlds because uh, this, this is a book that was, that was written at a time where the, the, the notions of technology didn't have like instantaneous hyperspatial travel. Uh, there, there's still a focus. This is one of the things that I really like in her description of this world. We get just enough insight on things like the, the length of time it takes to travel. You know, so even though oh, relativity is in is in effect, it, it's very it, that feel felt a lot like um, the, the later books in the Ender's Game saga, where you send out a message and then 50 years later, maybe someone shows up in a spaceship. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, and then one thing to keep in mind, too, and this this uh, I had to read separate i had to do supplementary research to kind of to to fully grasp this but it, it was it's part of a greater universe that she's created and that she spliced that ursula Le Guin spliced into uh into many of her books and the mm -hmm. idea and one thing that's very important is is the idea behind it is that human is that uh human life did not originate on earth that they, they originated essentially it's like the chase from episode from star trek next generation where it's gonna be so much reference to star <laughs> trek in this podcast I, but, but it but it is because it's a product of a time what was this 1969 1960 69 so we're uh, yeah. right smack in the the explosion of star trek as a cultural force or a cultural phenomenon and especially as i relate to science fiction there is a lot of original series Star Trek that I, I, I'm grasping at to try and make sense of the world she's created here. And that's not fair to her at all. It's oh, just, no. 
you know, it's kind of like yeah. you, you learn a little bit of a shorthand or you learn a little bit of a, a like a, a shortcut for describing certain aspects of science fiction. And the most readily accessible that we can come to is is classic Star Trek. Well, and it's, you know, it's because well, and also, you know, Star Trek has become an integral part of our of our culture. And and a lot of things that this book deals with is how how things that affect culture and what what things in life shape culture on yeah. there. So, and Definitely. so it's very relevant. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a difficult read. I'll say this <laughs> as far is, as you getting into it initially. Of, no, no, no. Okay. So, I mean, like you went, you went kind of squeaky and high pitched to yeah. describe. Oh, it wasn't. <laughs> um, no, this is actually one of the most challenging books I've, I've read recently. I, you know, you dig into a book like The Three Body Problem, which is dense and written from a culture that is very foreign to me and translated through the voice of another author who I very much respect. And you come to the end of that book and, and I like I just loved and appreciated it for what it was. This book was was a difficult read. I would say until we get to some of the more survival stuff towards mm -hmm. the end of the book. Again, we don't want to get too early into spoilers just yet for anyone who hasn't read a book from 1969. Um, <laughs> I, I, so for anyone who's watching, we do try and treat this as if you haven't read the book until we get to the final spoiler bit. Um, um, and, and we have from uh, in the live chat, we do have some people in the live chat from a rub b to you a rub a rub b to you i'm sorry i don't know what your twitter handle i mean your youtube handle is uh they they're commenting the same thing gotta be honest couldn't read it three body problem was much more accessible somehow and i had that same kind of experience just what did we get ourselves into what are we doing here because it's it's of a flavor of science fiction that i have a little difficulty with because it's not spaceships laser blasters and robots there are mm -hmm. fantasy elements, and then there's a lot of, obviously, a lot of socio-political commentary that's sort of wrapped up in its time. And I think one of the things that actually does a disservice to the narrative is the great lengths that uh, Ursula K. Le Guin goes through in her uh, preface of the story, where it's like, she's got to let us in on the joke. Um, she spends a, a significant amount of time before the book gets started in her foreword telling us about how science fiction isn't about predicting the future. It's really about addressing the current society that the author is writing from the perspective of and how that's, you know, that's really what fiction's all about. And, and there's, there's a point where it's like we all know that, uh, especially more modern audiences coming back to revisit this book. I would highly recommend skipping the foreword, jumping directly into the book, and then reading the supplemental. There's a foreword and then there's... Um, there's sort of an additional uh, 1984 style explanation of some of the language at the end of the book, um, because it just it immediately strips this book of charm and fantasy. And I already have a hard time with fantasy. I, I'm not I'm not really the biggest, you know, elves and goblins and, you know, scantily clad women in brass <laughs> plate with giant swords kind of guy. But there is a charm here that I feel might have been better served if we had just been allowed to get into the story and then at the conclusion of the story been asked to examine the state of science fiction as it pertained to 1969, especially as it being a parable for the, the current political climate, not, you know, an author who's really trying to predict the future. And, and I feel like we all know that, but having it sort of thrust into the spotlight before the story got started would feel it would feel you know it would feel a little like you're going into a found footage movie um you know like uh, Blair Witch Project and at the very beginning of the film a kindly old gentleman walks out on stage in a suit and tie and and, and taps on a microphone and says uh ladies and gentlemen we just need to make sure that everyone in the audience is aware that this is a complete work of fiction uh, none <laughs> of this is real uh we just don't want you to enjoy this or be too afraid uh so uh, all of this is fake and uh, enjoy the movie. Let's uh, let's go ahead and roll the film, and then walk <laughs> yeah. off stage. It, it felt a little like that. Like we we know we know it's not real. We know you know like a witch didn't really kill three teenagers in the woods, um, mm. but we kind of want to feel like a witch killed three teenagers in the woods, right? Well, <laughs> nice. this, the, the one the way I kind of viewed it, it felt a lot like say if I you know if I'm 
if I put in, you know, the DVD for Lord of the Rings and Peter Jackson has his little thing at, at the beginning and it, and the right. way he's narrating it is you've already seen it or read the books and, and seen it and, and already appreciate the work as a whole. Then you come back and do it. Well, it's kind of a, it's, yeah, it's like you said, like it, it kind of spoils it a little bit. So, right. you know, it, it's, it's, it asks us to, to analyze and to question with forethought our relationship with fiction before we can build a relationship with this piece of fiction and especially with her style of fiction and with her style of fiction this is an author of her time in 1969 writing this book there are so many passages of this story that feel that feel more than just a little bit cumbersome um there's 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 a love of language and coming out of voiceover i adore chewy language i like a book that i can really sink my teeth into um, but you know, again, I like, I like that to be, I like that to be delivered with some kind of purpose, with some kind of poetry or, or with some kind of design. Like I, I love chewing through Douglas Adams because I know what I'm going to get is a brain twisting examination of the absurd. This book felt like an exercise in adjectives getting in the way of making the point. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and when you're dealing with a story which is as rich as the world that she's creating in these series of books, that can be a significant barrier to delivering the fiction. Um, and not the least of which are just the changes in tone and the changes in uh, perspective. Uh, it's not it, it's not an established rule like we had in. Um, in Leviathan Wakes, where each each chapter is told from the perspective of a different character, here most of the book is told from the perspective of the ecumenical visitor, uh, mm -hmm. Jen Liai. But then there will be several passages where, with very little forewarning, we'll switch to either uh, uh, an old Gathinian uh, parable um, or the diary of another character. Who again, is Gathinian? Yes. <laughs> and and I was okay. So I I was reading through I was reading through and, and I, I finished a chapter and I move on to the next chapter. And this all takes place in the first person. And yes. And we're going through and I'm reading this next chapter and I'm just like, what's going on? <laughs> so and, and and first, I, I had to go reread the chapter because I until I realized. Yes, well, first person with sections that blur the present and the past tense. Mm -hmm. As they're recounting the events and then also explaining their current interpretation of those events, that to me became a very difficult way to transition through different parts of the story. And there are some passages where I really feel like the author couldn't finish that section of the story and sort of abandons a, a, a part of the narrative, switches gears starts with a new idea fresh and then is able to mm -hmm. come back to these characters. I, 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 I want to be careful here because I, the, there are some criticisms here that I could also lay on, on an author like, um, like Frank Herbert, you know, where, where there, there, there is a little bit of a mental block for me in just fully investing and fully consuming and fully diving into a book like Dune, um, which you sent me. And I, I thank you for sending <laughs> me that book. And I've been kind of paging through it. And then my sister also sent me just a, a heart wrenching story called station 11, which I'm also reading concurrently. And, and it's like, I, I have like no safe Harbor right now. I was bouncing back and forth between the left hand of darkness station 11 and doom. <laughs> and I'm just like, Oh man, what I wouldn't give for just like, I, I don't know the, the death and rebirth of Superman. We'll, we'll go into something, <laughs> something just, capes and cowls or something cheesy just to get my just brain out positive Star Trek, you know, you know, at the end of the day, before you go to bed and you'll be reset. Oh, what was, you know what I should reread? The what was the next gen novel where they encounter the follow up to the doomsday machine? Oh, I can't remember what that book is called. Oh. I love that book and I haven't read it in years. Anyway, that's yeah. not what we're talking about. This <laughs> well, so, OK, so, so we should probably example, the, real quick. I, I, oh, no, no, no. We, 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 we will get into the plot. But th there was an example that I wanted to bring up because it's very early in the story. It's on page 16 of my ebook. I'm pulling it up right now. And so um, this this is this is one description very early on in the story where 
Uh, Jen Lee is encountering a Gathinian procession where we're, we, as the audience, are introduced to the royal court, the king, and the prime minister of uh, Carhide, the the sort of loose collection of villages that make up one nation state on this planet. And it was this is where I knew I was already in trouble. Sixteen pages into the book. Um, Excuse me. The king, the king seems to be finished with his masonry work, and I rejoice. But crossing under the rise of the arch on his spider web of planks, he starts in on the other side of the keystone, which, after all, has two sides. It doesn't do to be impatient in Carhide. They are anything but a phlegmatic people, yet they are obdurate, they are pertinacious. They finish plastering the joints. And you're like, we spent two really long sentences, one run on sentence with three adjectives to all say they're, you know, they don't do things quickly. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult pair of sentences or actually trio of sentences to chew through. And I was having to like, I, I wasn't completely familiar with the phrase obdurate. So, you know, I pull up obdurate and obdurate is stubbornly refusing to change one's opinion or course of action, which then we look up phlegmatic. And phlegmatic is having an unemotion and stolidly calm disposition. And then we look up pertinacious. Come oh, no, no, no. Come on, search pertinacious. And that is holding firm to an opinion or a course of action. And you're like. I really feel there's a lot of gilding the lily there in trying to describe <laughs> what the the temperament of the Carhide individual is like, let alone the Carhide king. Well, and, and yeah, well, I was gonna say, yeah, it's, it's not only is she describing Carhide as like the Carhide culture as a whole, but also like the king in particular because he he absolutely he, that personifies his character almost. Yes. Um, and have you one thing I was thinking about after after I read this was. Yes. Oh, so, but, but, but while that describes the king, does it do to use a lot of flowery adjectives of less common parts of speech to describe an aspect of their personality, which is very forthright and very stubborn, and that these aren't a people who would likely take to using that kind of descriptive adjective or numerous descriptive adjectives to describe themselves? And that's where I had just a moment a moments of difficulty because the voice of the author seems to supersede the voice of the character from that first person narrative. There are moments where I feel she blurs in to utilize some, some of this impressive language where generally I is later described in the book as being more rash. Uh, he's b described as being younger. He's described as being a he. Um, and he speaks with, you know, in, in honesty, which is, is something else we'll we'll talk about the aspect of his character, which is revealed later on. That that to me, it's like again, that 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 creates just a little bit of a discord. You know, there's there's a little mm -hmm. th there's a little out of stepness um in trying to relate those ideas together in a way that really brings the audience into the story or helps explain, you know, that th that becomes a barrier. And and a part of this is I wonder if it's just I'm a more modern reader, which means I have a vocabulary of like a 10 year old from 1960. <laughs> I was going to say, would but, you say it's a little more alien? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, I would. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, don't. Yeah, it's, you know. <laughs> so well, I'm sorry. We, we, we should probably actually get into more of the, the plot and the structure <laughs> of the book. Well, we always do this. So like, we'll start getting into like, well, let me tell you about the philosophy of my ham sandwich this morning. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, and so I guess one thing we should say with all the Gathenians, they, they don't, they only, essentially, they go in, they go into heat. Uh, uh, oh gosh, what was the term for it? Kremer. Uh, uh, Kemmer. Yeah. Mm. And and they'll either become male or female during this period of time, and it's very heightened you know, sexual sense of, of needing to copulate and in their whole society, the, the idea behind this whole species that uh, Le Guin had uh, was what would a society be like if you took gender out of the situation, mm -hmm. out, out of the, out of it? Because I mean, gosh, they're even, they view people who the members of their society who stay as a gender as as one gender or the other all the time 
as uh, oh gosh, what was the, the what was the terminology they used? Uh, but they they frown upon it in much the same way that back in the '60s people would frown upon the idea of people being homosexual. She even mentions that yes. in the book, and that's a very important thing to understand about Gathenian culture and society as a whole in this book. Um, and so that also views uh, the, the so they view Jin Liai, who's a human in this sense too, because he's similar to how they, yeah. lo- how they look. He, um, the, the, I liked that. She described that he was able to largely blend in with their society yet. He still stood out for, if he encountered people for any length of time as being perpetually male meant that in this society, he was a, a, a pervert essentially. Yes. Uh, pervert. That's the term. Yes. Uh, cause, cause he's like basically a dude that's just permanently in heat. <laughs> right. Well, and he causes other people to go back into heat without even trying. It's just because of the fact that he, because he's basically in heat, heat, it caught, it is disruptive for those around him. Yeah. Um, so he's there at Carhide trying to convince the King. He's been there for about a year to trying to convince the King to join the Ecumen. And he's basically been in Carhide most of this time, this entire time hasn't mm-hmm. really ventured out that much. He's been, he's been toying, he's been playing, you know, he's been playing his part in the court. And uh, there's this other person named Estraven, who's the prime minister of Carhide, uh, who has been working behind the scenes before the novel even starts to, and he's been his closest ally and, and well, closest uh, advocate is probably a better term at this point in the book mm-hmm. and and Jen Liai doesn't quite trust him and a lot of that has to do with he's he's unsettled by Estraven's uh, uh, masculine and and feminine qualities and he's unsettled yes. by it and this is of course before the whole story happens, you know, continues through, but it's, See, and, and again, we've got, we've got a year of backstory and exposition that the, that the reader, it takes the reader a long time to be led into small parts of this. And a lot of this, you need to glean from future conversations that these characters have. And so I was really confused as I felt Jen Lee, I was much newer to this society at the beginning of the novel. And then it's sort of un- unveiled later that this has been conversations and political talks and uh, you know, sort of an ambassador role that he's been playing for the better part of a year. And we're like, wow. I'm still I'm still finding encounters with this character and I'm still reading language from this character that make me would make me think that this was a much fresher relationship than what well than what, what it might, really was well it might have been because he did he didn't really go outside of carhide that much so he had a very sheltered view of this society well and we and should very mention narrow carhide is, is one is one of these nation states that there are mm-hmm. numerous other nation states on this planet it, it is uh, sort of a perpetual I mean, it's called winter the planet's name is winter but it's a perpetual icy cold planet very little sort of uh, spring or summer season which is very very temperate and then uh you know just most of the year is is freezing or below freezing conditions in a majority of the planet and so it's a very tough living uh mm-hmm. on this on this world oh yeah well and uh what was it he he's he, as he's as he's moving through, he eventually gets an audience with the king, who very clear we realize very very quickly that he's n- not going to get he's not going to entertain Jen Liai's proposals whatsoever really, mm-hmm. and he ends up being uh, well first of all, uh, Estraven comes up t- to him and warns him about you know what's going to happen but of course there's miscommunication between them because of the cultural norms don't it just doesn't really jive um what what's the term um it's uh shift shift which is basically Shifgrethor. yes which is their their cultural norms i guess is is probably the best way to describe it uh, yeah, i mean so because like, you want to almost want to use a word like their their sense of pride but that's not quite appropriate um, it's like a cultural it's like a, it's like a culturally established sense of pride yes. and etiquette and kind of I based think. on an idea of unity between the masculine and feminine aspects of their society it's kind of all wrapped up mm-hmm. in duality and 
that's that's where the philosophy of this book becomes so interesting. And what I wish more of the book had focused on was the aspects of their culture, which sought to balance the individual and balance the society mm -hmm. and how the individual genders of a sexually dimorphous uh, society were so hideously foreign to them. They couldn't understand oh, yeah. only being one half of the equation. And that those were the parts of the book I was like, I was chewing through. It's just like page by page by page by page. And then we would kind of get into other aspects of the story. And again, it would kind of, I, I would feel like I was hitting a brick wall for a second. Um, but yes, with that, with that shift and then the sort of, the because it's not even just the Gathinian culture or the Carhide culture. It's, there's also an aspect of the fact that we're dealing with the government and with the royal family of this mm -hmm. planet too. So all of this pomp and circumstance get wrapped up in this, which leads to Jen Liai not understanding what his role would be in the future machinations behind the crown. And it's very quickly revealed after that point that a new prime minister is being brought into power. Estraven is ruled a traitor for entertaining the notion of joining forces with the ecumen in this society, which may or may not exist. Um, that they still don't fully believe that there is a world outside of theirs, that there are humans on other planet at planets outside of theirs. And generally, I could just be some random sex pervert that um, mm -hmm. that is being used to try and trick the king into doing something foolish. Oh, and so, it's like a Rasputin. It, they viewed him like a Rasputin, essentially. Yes, yes it's exactly. No, it's not, not a, like completely. Yeah, definitely. You know, and 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 so they excised him. You know, and it. Wow. Yeah, that's a really good actually analogy for that. Um, you know, it, well, and also here, the other part of this too is whenever someone is banished from Carhide, no one is allowed to speak to this person. They have, what was it? They have uh, until essentially the, that night. Essentially yeah, I, I thought that out. was really kind. You know, like you've got yeah. 12 hours, and then not only are you dead to us, but if we see you again, you'll be executed. And if anyone right, talks well, to you, they too will be ostracized from society and executed. And if they, yeah, if they talk to you, they help you or anything. And so. Yeah, boy, you know, it, he, so Estraven leaves. Then eventually the same thing happens to our main character. And I was very impressed in their ability to run. <laughs> you know, to get out of there. You know? I had well, no trouble getting is, out of my own town. Where, you know, so. And this is where the more adventure aspects of the story come into play. Where Jen Lee, I, in losing losing this position with the, the with Carhide, um, goes on to explore another... This this one is a more bureaucratic nation state, mm -hmm. which I don't know that I can pronounce. It's oh. was it, was this one the one that had uh yeah this was the one where they had everyone spying on each other. Oh. Yeah 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 no exactly uh, that that yeah that's what I mean is so in in between so is it Orgorian is that how you pronounced it? Yes, that's that's how I was sort of saying it in my brain. I'm probably wrong. Um, but he, he decides that he's going to try and uh, try and convince another nation state to consider uh, joining forces politically with the acumen because this is his mission. And one of the things I really liked was the notion of this ambassador being one individual being sent down in the most modest way possible so as not to cause too much of a disturbance or to um, excite the population too much. It's not like an alien mm -hmm. invasion force. It's not... Um, you know, it's not something to be viewed as a military invasion or, or some sort of aggressive action. It's one individual who has to go down and then try to assimilate as best they can. And, and there's some really beautiful ideas in that notion of even though we're coming from this advanced collection society of different planets, we'll still have things that we need to learn about your society when we come down to visit you. And so that's that's the hand the hand that we're extending. That's the olive branch that we're extending. And mm -hmm. it's very likely that the one person who goes down first probably won't survive because of yeah. whatever local, uh, you know, uh, bias or um, 
superstition or mythology that that culture might have. Uh, it's it's very uh, I forget exactly how it was phrased, but it's later in the book. He he uh, generally I mentions it's it's usually the second ambassador who's much more <laughs> successful. Yeah, <laughs> reaching out to a new society. But on the way to Orgorian, my favorite my favorite parts of the book are exploring sort of the mythology and some of the religious aspects of Gethenian culture. And I think that's where we get our best insight into the duality concept, the the notion of a society society of people who are not divided on the kinds of gender roles that we encounter in our society. And while there are still notions of imbalance between various roles, those moments are temporary. They're, they're temporary mm -hmm. conditions. You know, pregnancy is a temporary condition. It's not one gender who is only capable of bearing children. Um, I, I, any member of Gethenian culture can can bear children or impregnate another member of the society. It all just depends on the momentary condition of two Gethenians meeting, and then their their chemistry will dictate who becomes the more masculine and who becomes the more uh, feminine mm -hmm. in that one individual encounter. And then building that into there, there is some mysticism, there is some woo in this book where because of this sense of unity that they've developed a, a method of foresight where they can be mm -hmm. a, a, a very effective at predicting the future, but in a very Buddhist kind of way, it's the only way that you can become effective at predicting the future is if you also give up any design on knowing the future being good, <laughs> you know, like, it, right. it, like it, it won't help you. And that's the only way that you can become proficient at this, this act of force. I mean, it was like, again, it was like the, the best possible way to say it's like, well, yeah, we're really good at predicting the future, but eh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> was, they, well, later in the book, they talk about uh, how it's, it's more they're they're They've become gifted at the hunch and how, you know, how it, yeah, that, like it's a, more like, like a, it's more like a hunch. Thing. Yeah, it's yeah. more of an instinct in, uh, with the hunch, and and it it really accurately describes it. Um, I you know I will say from from the Gathenians' point of view, I mean I kind of don't blame them for being super suspicious <laughs> of the main character. <laughs> I mean, you think about it too, because okay, so I was talking earlier about how there was this this mythology beforehand that mm -hmm. that, that was made. Well, part of this the whole. But the whole thing with the ecumen is basically they have a manifest destiny of bringing of reuniting all of the different species that that's that spread out from where they originated. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it am I the only one who kind of thinks it's a mistake to try and bring a non spacefaring race? Oh, you're just into <laughs> colored by your prime directive. It's true. Nerd. <laughs> Well, you know, and not everyone, not every not everything has to be well, even not even space faring, but just having having the because and this happens in the book too, where they talk about um approaching one government. Like uh, there's no unified government on this planet. So mm -hmm. what and and they in the the political imaginations and what happens when Jen Lee uh, arrives at the next at the sec, at the second country that he from his exile um they talk about how they can use it to their advantage and how uh you know well if we become allied with the ecumen first then we have a permanent advantage over carhide yeah. and, and and that's dangerous then and it, they only they only they touch on it a little bit that i don't feel that the danger the overarching danger for the planet as a whole is really uh, touched on as much because they turn more and focus on the individuals, which honestly, I think where, where we get to the, the story becomes smaller is mm -hmm. where the book really shines to, for me. Okay. Personally. Yeah. But, uh, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're not quite there yet. So, I mean, like to, to your point though, about whether or not we, we should aspire to the prime directive. I question whether or not there is an arbitrary threshold at which, the the exposure to a more advanced society is necessarily always going to be harmful. And so I don't necessarily disagree with the ecumenical stance in this book of going out to approach 
these 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 sort of tangent arms of humanity because in this story again 1960s sci-fi authors love to play with what today we would consider stories built on some notion of intelligent design mm -hmm. that 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 the the, the the human condition has been created or has been altered by an alien intelligence with design or with purpose beyond our current understanding um, like I love 2001 a space odyssey because it's like the 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 best love letter to intelligent design that no one ever asked for um, <laughs> and yet it's still like this wonderful grounded piece of rationalist grounded science fiction and and like it's a phenomenal book but when viewed through the cultural lens of the world we live in 30 years afterwards um, there are a couple notes in that book where you kind of wonder what what was what was the purpose behind exploring this concept in the way that they explored it and so when we when i see the ecumenical reach, reaching out to these slightly less advanced societies i didn't believe that the authoring of the gathenians it wasn't like you know the federation landed on a medieval world you know it's true that's true they did. They didn't have industrialization of a sort. They didn't have an industrial well, revolution and, but. and fairly advanced industrialization for 1969, mm -hmm. given the conceit that this was a planet that was, you know, covered in ice for most of the year. I. Uh, Th that that's actually one of the things that another one of the it's a little throwaway moment in the book where they describe that. Um, Jen Lee, I talking about something like air travel was something of a foreign concept because this is a planet without birds that fly. Mm -hmm. So we just, it, it wasn't through any lack of intelligence. It's just, they'd never seen anything fly and it just never considered that as being a viable means of transportation. So no one ever bothered to try and, and create the apparatus through which a human being could get into a self-powered airship. But this is a society that is, is very well, uh, is very well armed for um it is very well armed for combating the cold they have these amazing little space heaters which also double as uh stoves um that that uh we we encounter on a sort of a future aspect of the uh, the adventure part of the story uh talking about um some survivalist gear and that they have all electric vehicles you know that they 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 are a sufficiently advanced society it's just the the constraints of living on such a a terribly rugged world kept them from ever organizing or developing scientifically. It's not through any lack of intelligence. It's oh, it's no. just the, the 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 constraint of the the planet's environment that mm -hmm. is sort of holding them back. And if I were to look at that, so if we're talking prime directive, then yes, you can't contact them because they're not a warp capable society. But again, would they ever become a warp capable society without some kind of aspiration, some kind of encounter, something to help them rise above just the how many of them are, are living lives of survivalism? You know, like the main yeah. focus is don't freeze to death nine months out of the year. Well, it's a, it's, it's a kind of a, a shove to to cause a whole society to change and grow essentially because it's well i mean a good example of of things that shape their well one thing that could also shape their society too is just like they talk about how there's not a huge variety of flora and fauna mm -hmm. you know fauna and even in animal life there's almost no animal life uh but there's but they make up for it in quantity so yeah. like the, <laughs> so they'll have like this and later in the book they talk about this how there's this forage you know there's just giant forest but it's all one type of tree you know and and it's that kind of that kind of narrow focus of that shaped their culture that and which also translates to you know the fact that their gender really isn't a factor for them too that kind of focuses their culture and, and development as a society mm -hmm. um that you know, that's one reason, you know, why when Jen Lee comes in, just throws a wrench in everything. <laughs> right. So, um, oh, yeah. And, and, see, and don't you feel like it would have been it would have been helpful to see more practical examples as to Jen Lee I's involvement being more disruptive 
to their society. Uh, the middle third of the book takes place in the city state or, or the governmental bureauc- bureaucratic state of or- Orgorian. Mm-hmm. I'm totally mispronouncing that Orgorian. Um, and this nation is built much more sort of Nixon era politically devious, where mm-hmm. there are layers of bureaucracy within this nation state's government. People are constantly spying and ratting on each other. There's like a secret police that aren't so secret yeah. that everyone knows about, but no one knows what they might be up to or what they might be listening to. And if you're a dissident of any kind, you're removed from that society in kind of a 1984 fashion where you're, oh, yeah. you're sort of like shipped off to some sort of work camp, which eventually uh, Jen Lee sort of steps on enough toes politically while trying to engage in this ambassador role that he's been thrust into. Um, and he is, he's removed from the society, thrown in the back of a truck and is, is put on, put into a labor camp where he's not really equipped to properly join the roughest aspects of, of a society where, you know, their evolution has led them to being able to survive the cold. So it's a very precarious position that he finds himself in, but because the, the, I think the, the part of the book where we had the most potential to see what his impact might have been in disrupting the society is also the part of the book where he's removed from society and thrown into the back of the truck and he's disappeared. I, again, I just felt like there was an opportunity there to show the reader how how a sexually differing individual could impact a larger swath of this population. Like we, we hear like, Oh, he's a pervert and this could be bad and it might be and there. There could be a problem, but we're never really showing an example of how even with the best of intentions, you know, not, not necessarily through like, you know, disease. We're not talking about like encountering the right. native population and killing them all because you have swine flu. Um, it's um, even just, exposing them to thoughts they never would have had Mm -hmm. could have been potentially disruptive. And I don't think we ever got to see a clear example of that. In fact, most of the people he encounters, there are these positive affirming interactions that he has with the general population or with some of their mystics or some of their spiritual leaders. And all of them kind of come to this, like, yes, there's a meeting of the minds and you're like minded and we will strive for togetherness and we will appreciate your message. And then at the same time, we've got other members of their society and other members of their body politics saying, oh, well, this could be bad because you're a pervert. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like we never saw where that could have been a problem. Well, and it, I think there are a couple of places that I feel like that they could have introduced that. Uh, like, and this is an example of where I feel like how when the story is smaller, like when the when the, when the focus is is smaller, uh, the story shines, and it could have shined even more. Where you know, uh, whenever he, oh, it would have been perfect if they had had. Because uh, by the way, also Estrovan, uh, he meets up with Estrovan at this, this uh, second country. And who's advising after, behind, after uh, being politically exiled, he he flees yes. to Orgorian, and uh, that's where Jen Li Ai meets back up with him again to try and complete his mission of finding some faction that will join the Ecumen. Oh yeah, and it would have been really great to see because this is his, because this is as far from what I remember, this was his first time actually going there, and mm-hmm. like his his entry in could have been really nice to have his first interaction with everyone kind of spread the, the, I won't say discontent, but just uh, the cultural influence and impact that he, his presence and disruptive impact that, that, that they would have had, which would have led to, which would have actually rationalized even more what actions are taken after he's been there for a bit. Right. Um, And, and then he's taken, you know, taken off to this work camp where, and it's, it's, uh, and essentially it's, it's like they're taking him to Siberia, essentially. Oh, that's not how you described it in our notes. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Come on, Trek nerd. Come on. Come on. Wait a minute. Where, where, oh, I gotta it's find It's like that. the prison planet of Rorope. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. So, so during that whole, during that, okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like okay, let's, let's 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 let's. I'm just going to preface here from from about this point on. If you haven't read the book or you're not thinking about finishing the book or you're you're not with us and completing it, we're we're getting into sort of the last third of the novel, and 
while I'm sure you could look this up on Wikipedia and get a much more in-depth spoiler, you know, plot de description, this is where we're going to be kind of giving up the ending of the book here. But we, we get into this last third of the book. He's uh, generally has been shipped off to a work, a labor camp. Um, Estervan still very passionately believes in this mission for his entire people that this rises above the pettiness of individual nation states, which may or may not enter into their first war ever. Mm -hmm. If we have the potential, the backdrop is potentially leading Gathenian culture into their first massive conflict between nation states. This is a this is a, a planet where because conditions are so harsh, you've never had a decent enough population build up the resources to waste them mm -hmm. on something like war until now. And so for Estraven, there's a uh, uh, sort of a clear and present danger in allowing society to devolve into the squabbling or, or the nationalism of, of, of this type of conflict. And he sees in Gen Lee the perfect opportunity to, to sort of kick his own people in the ass to see something larger than just the individual uh, nation state. And so when he learns of Gen Lee I's, uh, you know, sort of disappearance and and this this labor camp that he's been thrown into, he sets out on a mission to rescue Jen Lee I, and then because they're both wanted individuals, Jen Lee I is you know sort of a dissident of Orgorian, and Estravan is a dissident and uh, has been kicked out of Carhide. They have to brave the coldest parts of winter on a mission to get Jen Lee I back to Carhide even though uh, Estraven has been um, has been exiled from Carhide. Yeah, that's a huge risk that he takes doing that. Yes. That, you know, and it, it's... Well, and it, here's the other thing I, I, I didn't quite understand. Because um, as I understood it, I was exiled from Carhide as well. Oh, see, I didn't get the sense that he was exiled i just got the sense that the prime minister that replaced him wanted to make an example out of estraven and that it was it was sort of tacitly agreed upon that Gen Lee i's mission would be a failure here and that he should maybe consider going off to explore some somewhere else see that's because the weird the, thing oh, Gen sorry, Lee i did not leave with the same urgency that estraven did he kind of took his time gathered his resources collected his collected his, hmm. his personal belongings um and then took a very slow moving truck out of carhide to go and explore some religious temples before going on to orgorian so you're not wrong though where again and i think this is because uh ursula Le Guin is writing this with the same kind of obtuseness that Jen Lee I would have encountered. Like, I don't think Jen Lee I fully understood himself whether oh, or not no. he was of the same class of non person as Estraven was going to become, or if he was just going to be an annoyance that if he continued to operate in Carhide, he eventually also would have been, been exiled. And because I don't think Jen Lee I fully understood because of the cultural differences between their, their two peoples, then I don't think the, the reader ever gets a very clear sense of just exactly on what ground did Jen Lee I stand on. And I think it's because of that unknown that the character actually is motivated to leave of his own accord. Mm -hmm. um, which is just more politically convenient for the new prime minister um, who, who is... Uh, who, who is also the one who's sort of drumming up support for for a war against Orgorian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I mean, and as they're at, during this, ep this epic journey is what I was thinking of when I when we were talking before, uh, while we I was reading this about Rupente, you know, I was just imagining them. Yeah, just imagining wearing all the furs, you know, and everything. But like, and, and when I was listening to this, I actually made a point to there was a there was a specific point where they come up to this des this pure desolation and it just, it's basically them. They, they come uh, what was it like this Valley and it's just complete frozen desolation. And they're basically mm -hmm. looking at their own deaths yeah. and, and Estraven says, I'm glad I lived to see this. And all I like, and, and it was actually really fortunate too, that I was, okay, fine. I was listening to the Star Trek six soundtrack cause it seemed to fit, you know, <laughs> 
And <laughs> and and that that scene where the music from that scene where they like the the wide shot where they're on the glacier and it's yeah. looking across. I know exactly that, what you're talking about because yes, that's totally the image I had in my brain too. I'm not gonna lie. Oh my gosh, yeah, and it was perfect. And and my fa- this this journey is my favorite part of the book by far because you get you the story is smaller. You get uh, Estraven and I like ha- being forced to work together and come to an understanding of each other and and, and what and makes them come to an understanding take. literally because if they don't they die absolutely or yeah death, if they can't even just get over some of the cultural and communications barriers mm-hmm. people and this to me becomes like the beautiful combination of um oh, what is that movie enemy mine yes it does it was exactly what i was okay. thinking of too so, like if you were to set <laughs> enemy mine in a jack london novel like in a you know like yep just <laughs> run the frozen tundra of alaska and you're an alien species that was trying to kill me and now we understand each other and we can work together and you know oh and here let's push this sled because it's got all our food on it um mm-hmm. it, again like the way that those pieces of the story come together the last third of this novel where it throws off the shackles of socio-political commentary it throws off any kind of conversation about different differing types of governments of uh sexual relations you know there's sort of just different gender dynamics and it becomes a basic story of survival from two people who need to have a meeting of the minds i think is the most accessible part of the book and it comes mm-hmm. at the end of this story it, i two-thirds of this book were an intrepid slog. I keep wanting to come back to a word like cumbersome mm-hmm. or ponderous. And then the last third of the book just flew. Oh yeah. Well, like, it, it, again, because that, that was the least precious in terms of commentary and the most direct in terms of, you know, just sort of adventure narrative. And, and so no big surprise being a dude from the 21st century, um, give me a good adventure story of about survival between two people. And, and, you know, they, they come to an understanding and you're like, yep, I'm for it. I get it. I understand all the tropes here. I understand all of, you know, the, the mechanics of this part of the story. And it became the easiest uh, aspect of the novel to kind of get through. And, and I think one of the more enjoyable parts of the book too. Oh yeah. Well, it's, it's, I felt very much, the same sort of enjoyment vibes that I got out of this, this last third of the book where it's just I and Estraven as the same sort of narrative satisfaction I got from the two towers whenever they went with Frodo and Sam. Okay. You know, on there, that and, makes sense. you know, bring, bringing all the peripheral stuff down and narrowing it. And it really helped to focus the book for me. And, mm-hmm. and it was, it, you know, the, I, I enjoyed that the most out of all of it. They had, uh, I mean, also added dynamics to it where the fact that uh, you, they, I was forced, and so was Esterman, to, to con- I was forced to confront his misgivings about Estervan and uh, uh, Gathenian sexuality as a whole because mm-hmm. Estervan goes into a, uh, 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 Kemmer. Goes into heat. Kemmer, yes, thank you. Uh, goes into Kemmer while they're there in this tiny little tent, and you know, and he's basically, you know, Estervan at at this point. It doesn't help also that she, she uses the he, male pronoun for everyone on this planet. Yeah. So okay, we should probably talk about this because you and I both had notes <sighs> um, on one of the major themes of this story and one of the backbones why this was such a critically acclaimed story and why I feel it's still so important today even if I don't feel that it's the most enjoyable read that I've ever had. This is kind of, for me, it was kind of like the science fiction equivalent of, of eating your least favorite vegetables, but darn, they're good for you. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what do we do when we strip away all aspects of gender dichotomy in a society and what are we left with? And that is a major aspect of the conversation that Ursula K. Le Guin is trying to have. Now, as a 21st century member of society, as we're trying to unravel some of the the social and political aspects of gender nonconformity in our own society, and people start talking about things like pronouns, mm-hmm. uh, this is where the book actually hasn't aged super well. Um, yes. we, we run into discussions of a society where gender 
is not a driving force in what might separate various aspects of members of this society. Yet, even those individuals tend to think either gender dimorphously, you know, in masculine traits and feminine traits, as opposed to unifying traits with temporary conditions of masculinity and temporary conditions of femininity. Um, and that they still do exhibit once they're in camera and they start to exhibit those different roles, like their biology will change to match the aspects of masculinity or femininity. One of the biggest things that I had a problem with, and this is a super small nitpicky thing, but one thing I couldn't get my brain over was a society that only views gender as a temporary condition, not having a unifying pronoun for mm -hmm. what their people are. She You've got all it. these outlandish science fiction words about, you know, you know, Shifgrathor and, and mm -hmm. Kemmer and like they were asked to go through a lot of language and yet they don't have a word for Gethenian, you know, like human yeah. that they can refer to themselves as, as the pronoun or as the collective. And so we're left with the very clumsy article. He, which generally I writes in one of his, I, well, just because, you know, collectively we all, we use the word, the masculine, whenever we talk about an entire group of people and that's fine. If you were viewing this culture from outside and you hadn't been living with them for the better part of two years by the time this novel concludes, I really feel that society would have a way to self-identify. <laughs> right. Well, she should have. I Well, I'm backseat writing here, but like, I feel like. Oh, yeah. Was, I mean, we're totally doing this, this entire podcast. <laughs> this is the most critical we've ever been. Yeah. Well, okay, Ursula like K. Le Guin, I know you just recently passed away, but let me tell you, as as a 30-something dude, uh, why you're wrong <laughs> with your feminist science fiction. Well, uh, and I mansplain my way through your book. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think it would have been, I think this book would have would have benefited from having a maybe a short chapter at the very like a short short chapter at the very beginning, just uh oh, it would be perfect just to have have an account. Of the very first people who were who envoys, because there were there were envoys before I who came, who yep. first discovered the planet, having their first impressions and have, Bing Bang Boom, like put put a couple of like like the the gender neutral pronoun that, that would have made this make a little more sense overall narrative wise and message wise, have that in there and establish it, and then go from there, mm -hmm. and then I, I think it would have been a lot easier. Uh, but oh, I agree because, because we also do that. We, we, this is one of the things that I, like, it bothers me a little bit about 1984 and it bothers me a lot of it with left hand of darkness where we're asked to unravel complex language ideas and things like, you know, the, the time of day or the time of year in this book. And they go through their words for different months. You know, majority of the book is just mm -hmm. written in American English, except for the fantasy words that we have to put in where she'll use fantasy words for the date. You know, that mm -hmm. that makes sense. They would have their own words for the day of the week and their own words for their idea of a month, a month being about 26 days. Um, but we don't get an accounting of that until we get to the section at the conclusion of the story. And that's like new oh, yeah. The analysis of Newspeak at the end of 1984. Uh, yeah. And and you're absolutely right that instead of prefacing the book with Ursula K. Le Guin's pinings, opinings on how science fiction it only relates to the time that it was written in, maybe give us some other insight, some some leader, some kind of preface on Gathenian culture from the view of someone who probably never got out of the spaceship. Right? Yeah, that'd be great. That's what we are as the viewers. We're the people who are at arm's length from all of this and not embroiled in it and not a part of it. And so that perspective of someone looking out the window and going, huh, that's weird. You know, they have both <laughs> penises and vaginas and then flies <laughs> off into the cosmos. Like, would have been helpful. <laughs> it's a, I'm just imagining that right there. Well, that's weird. Huh. You know. <laughs> like, well, I'm not going down there. Hey, what's generally doing? <laughs> it's a jerk. Oh man. Well, you know, and and you know, with uh, it's interesting too that uh, I found it. And this is also from earlier in the book when he's talking to the king. Uh, how they say, you know, they're saying, "Are you not to 
to, you're not going to invade us. Well, what if I tell you to leave? Well, I'll leave. Well, I kind of don't believe that for a couple of reasons. Because one, he spent so long getting there that everyone he knows and loves is dead. Yeah. Uh, and if I was in that position, I'd be kind of committed at that point. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Although you know what I do respect in in terms of the way the, the way that I felt that she was portraying his temperament. I really didn't get the sense that Jen Li I was discussing him abandoning his mission by leaving the planet. I think for for the way that we saw his commitment throughout the book, it was more I'm either successful or I'm not. And if I'm not, I'm probably dead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that takes so, an incredible amount of commitment from. So, you know, character. when the king saying like, and what if we tell you, you know, like what we ask you to leave? And he was like, well, I'd leave. And on this planet. If I'm not a member of some community, I'm dead. <laughs> well, also, because the, the, uh, one thing that they reveal later, too, that he didn't reveal to anyone until he came to the second group that ended up sitting the second country that sent him to the concentration camp right. was that their ship is in solar orbit. Yes. And wait, everyone else in cryosleep waiting for to hear from him. Uh, well... The most cumbersome way of communicating with that ship ex exists. You know, you'd think that he'd have, with something as advanced as they are, that you'd have a communicator oh, he or did. something. No, he yeah, did. Yeah, but it's like, but not no, so, 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 Oh. No, so he had the Ansible, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah you're right. You're okay, right, so right. you're, but, but you're not I wrong. Was, I it, felt it was more, like, more cumbersome to use. Oh, no, no, no. So, 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 again, because this is not, an Isaac Asimov style science fiction story where more of the book is, is, you know, sort of detailing what the logic puzzle of the plot is going to be. And then all of the cool scientific doodads that accompany it. I don't think she does a great job of expressing that when he lands on the planet, his rocket is taken by Carhide and is examined by Carhide and is kept from everybody. It's basically just this private mm -hmm. piece that the king and maybe a, a handful of their top intelligence people know about. But he did also have an advanced communications device which allowed him real-time communication with other members of the Ecumen, and that was taken by Orgorians. Oh, okay, okay. So he had an Ansible yeah. that, that could give him near real-time communication with oh. people, yeah. but... When he was sent to the labor camp, there was also a backup method of communication based just on regular radio waves. And that's what he had to get back yeah. to Carhide to communicate with the ship. She doesn't go through you, like you encounter the Ansible in a book like Ender's Game. And there's just the, the little paragraph that explains to the dumb reader like me what WTF that is and how it works or you know basically expressing that it's science fiction magic right yeah but that's i mean that's all it is whenever you have that kind of in near instant communication over the vast distances of space <laughs> like subspace in in star trek like yeah, oh yeah exactly. we're, we're going faster than the speed of light and we're you know hundreds of light years away from each other but let's have a conversation <laughs> you know like yeah. that's that's sci-fi magic is essentially what it is oh, yeah. it's conjuring but we call it subspace um, they did have that here, but she didn't, but she didn't take the time or she didn't expend the effort to delineate that as well as I feel she could have. And this is, I, I really don't feel that those types of aspects of storytelling are her strengths. This book plays to the cultural conversation. It plays to uh, the, the, the gender relationship conversation. But I, I did want to circle back to just to kind of your point. One of the things that I found most disingenuous about the character of I and what the ecumen's mission might be is it th their their success or failure isn't pinned on one individual. Mm -hmm. So if the king comes to Jen Li Ai and says, like, well, what if I asked you to leave? Jen Li Ai can say, well, I'll leave. And leaving a community or being, you know, sort of exiled from a community means death in your world. But I won't be the last envoy is what he doesn't say. Right. It'll and then like, another ambassador come to convince you to join the ecumen. And that that individual will come, you know, after a message has been sent, which means it'll be another 50 or 100 years before they arrive here. 
and you'll be dead so we won't have to fight you but the legend of the weird sex pervert will still live on well in, in the second the in, in the second country they said what was it four years of no contact after this point they'll send someone else down yeah. anyway so it's, it's, it's so it's even that so they're so they'll just keep sending people so they're not going to take no for an answer <laughs> really and so not really and that's why i bring back to the intergalactic manifest destiny yeah it, it, it kind of you know? is and and that's where i had a little bit of a disconnect with his cause because of that and but well that's and, and you know, we can always point to sort of an, an uh, aspirational altruism in the world of Star Trek. Like we're always going to see humanity on their best day in classic Star Trek or in Star Trek The mm -hmm. Next Generation. And this is a different take on the notion of. Of interspatial governance, but it doesn't necessarily come from the same kind of wagon train in space altruism that Gene Roddenberry was trying to express at the height of the Cold War. Instead, this is reflective of a very North American first world politic. Mm -hmm. And especially from the perspective of, you know, like we're going to come to a culture which isn't as well developed as ours and we're going to expose them to ideas and technology and uh, cultural attitudes that we trade on whether they want to or not. <laughs> yeah. And especially for yeah. whatever natural resource that area might have. I mean, the world of winter is a poor example because they can't believe that there's a lot that an advanced spacefaring world would, I mean, a community would want to utilize from that planet other than just this, this one altruistic notion of combining all of the worlds of man again. Outside yeah. of that, there's, there's not as much benefit. So we could maybe point to that as being their their version of an altruistic uh outreach program but more often than not whenever we see the uh, a significant differing in culture in terms of you know technological adaptation it's the 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 less technologically advanced society which tends to not do so well in maintaining yeah. the unique aspects of their culture yeah yeah it's, i was gonna say it's usually the culture and the culture is de usually decimated and also there's just the people themselves are decimated too and it's yeah i uh, i don't know it's you you're you're enough of a trek fan <laughs> that the ecumen give you the willies let's let's yes put it yes way. it's I, I could believe it in the mirror universe you know <laughs> just slightly no! few ragged, ragged, ragged they're, they're not they're not like crazy <laughs> mustache twirling stab you in the back Macbethian society they're they're yeah they're they're, they're okay oh, chiller more, than that. all right more like the expanse they're just gonna send a bunch of ice haulers to that planet that that's okay. their goal actually you know <laughs> yeah okay uh, maybe i'll give you that i i just i just, i finally started watching the expanse tv show and i need to start book two you know maybe that'll be my diversionary like that'll get me dig me out of this like trench oh <laughs> tough well do we want well, it's like, do we want to wait and cover that book since we cover the first one? You know, we're only doing one book a month. We might want to, you know, like okay. revisit once I've finished the series and then we can maybe do a recap on. That'd be good. That'd be good. Series. Yeah. But then I, I get the thing I want to throw to you and the thing I want to posit, because, you know, we there's a lot of philosophy that goes into this book and especially for the perspective, you know, there's almost the reverse of the preface of this book, which becomes truth in science fiction becoming an example of its time, then when viewed through the lens of history, is maladapted to the time that someone might read it in generations later. You know, as, as mm -hmm. cultural norms change, does science fiction become less accessible to a degree if it's built overly on the idea of examining the current social ill of the day. You know, I, I kind of feel like Asimov ages a little bit more gracefully because he actually wasn't super great at tackling, you know, the socio-political structure mm -hmm. of the time or, you know, the religion of the time or like his stories are just, you know, very poorly characterized logic puzzles you have to kind of yeah. unravel what 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 happens but he tackled a very similar idea of a sexually different society in uh what was the name of that book 
um, the gods themselves, mm. where there's a parallel dimension to Earth where we we're, we're we find this new energy source. We're kind of pulling energy out of this source, and it turns out that it's an actual altered dimension, other dimension, where the beings on the planet that sort of mirrors ours are different states of energy, and it takes three of these beings to copulate to produce the next generation. And I don't think it was written too far from the time period that Ursula K. Le Guin is writing this story to. Ursula K. Le Guin deserves so much more accolade and so much more um, prestige for tackling this book in a narrative that introduces this concept very directly with a lot of oh, yeah. for uh, foresight and forces you to kind of uncomfortably untangle how you might feel as the other, you know, if you're viewing this from mostly from the perspective of Jen Lee, I, you know, if you were to walk into a society that you're like, Oh, well, you've got hair on your face. You're a sexual deviant, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, there would be a defensiveness I feel to encountering mm -hmm. that kind of a society. Well, like, and she it's, it's more of a, I feel it's more of a challenge to the gender norms that we as a society are, are now beginning, you know, kind of ex growing from, uh, right. you know, when, whenever you're bringing a story where instead of having, you know, having, three different genders where they have to come together and copulate having a hermaphroditic species uh, that, that that trades places between masculine and feminine traits. Right. And it, it's, it's very different because shoving... three energy beings sort of morphing into one gelatinous blob of goo to produce other gelatinous blobs of goo. Doesn't, doesn't unsettle you as much as, you know, mm -hmm. what genitals are you going to have today? <laughs> right. Well, and, and it's, it's so moved from... <laughs> this video has no hope of being monetized by Google <laughs> I anymore. I love it. Oh, oh, speak, speaking of, of, uh, this book mentioning genitals. So I, I started out, that's, that's not an ominous way of beginning. Um, so I started out listening to the audiobook, which I don't recommend the version I listened to because it so sounds like does, does the does the narrator get uncomfortable with these concepts? Is it like well, is it he did a good job of making he did a good job of making me uncomfortable. Um, it was more so okay. It sounded like Vigo the Carpathian from Ghostbusters Two <laughs> is you know he so he's talking about you know, going with the ecumen you know but. Then their genitalia became engorged, and oh, you're like, no. I'm like, oh my god, what have I done? <laughs> so I had to go. I switched out of I that. Made a terrible <laughs> mistake. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I also it, it, okay. Other thing with thing to note about this audio, the audiobook version, the author make he's in the same monotone, the entirety of the of, of every word that's written that's written. I wonder if there's not a, an aspect of like this book needs to be handled with a delicacy and a respect yeah, that mm -hmm. there are concepts in the story that I still think in this modern era of sexual expression could still make some audience members uncomfortable and I wonder if there wasn't some design for when this was recorded probably recorded you know years ago um, mm -hmm. If there wasn't some design on like, how do we express this with sensitivity? And you're like, nope, not too, no too, not too much expression. We need someone who's going to sound clinical. We need mm -hmm. someone who's going to approach this story in a very scientific fashion. It's, it's, you know, that kind of cultural examination scalpel their way through this book. And unfortunately, it sounds like something like that would also suck all the life out of a narrative. Well, another thing towards the end of the book. At the end, actually, it's the, at the end of the book where uh, he finally meets up with humans again, and mm -hmm. and you know, and it, this just kind of occurred to me where he they talk about how well uh, he there's a female and a male that he meets up with, and he's like, well, one's voice is just uh, too high and one's just too low, and and it's because the Athenians have kind of a middle, you know, they're just kind of and straight they find up in the a middle or a balance, yeah, right. And well, and I wonder if that's kind of what they tried to do with the audiobook. But didn't really that was Vigo the Carpathian? <laughs> yeah, oh my. well, yeah, it didn't help that it was like some 60, 60 to 70 year old guy with the voice who's uh, his voice is like a subwoofer filled with rocks to oh, talking, you know? Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I think of when I think of like, hey, let's let's talk about because they're not even like 
they're not see and this is also part of the issue is the book is a, is a work of fantasy doesn't they're not like asexual and they're not bisexual and they're not it's it's like you want to use a word like ambisexual mm-hmm and that sounds like handy capable like is, is an insulting kind of way <laughs> so what I think of as the narrator of that book is really old dude with a big thick gravelly voice to to chew his way through delicate commentary from a female author and a slightly more feminine point of view I I don't know I mean like do do you feel for today that the book still accomplishes the kind of hard, hard examination or commentary that I'm sure must have shaken up audiences in 1969. I think it does in a way, if you think about it rather than just the biological sex, it's sex versus gender and in terms of gender being gender gender identification now because that was mm -hmm. this is kind of before gender identification that was kind of separated if you you can still kind of apply it towards that but that is kind of where it's dated a little bit too yeah. where so yes that i'd say in that in those sort of terms but also in the base in the more base terms of of loyalty duty versus loyalty versus duty tied in with all of that because of what happens at the end with uh Estraven and and I which I won't spoil uh but I think I mean, it is. you're, you're kind of struggling with that question I mean like I ha I don't know that I have an answer for it myself I it's <sighs> it's difficult for me to try and put myself in the shoes of someone who hasn't been exposed to like in 1969, you would have maybe used a word like aberrant, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. alternative lifestyles or the, the yeah. different types of linguistic gymnastics that we have to go through because there are difficult concepts to convey in how we relate to each other as human beings. Even trying to get away in modern society from necessarily calling specific traits masculine traits or feminine traits. You get into a conversation about like successful CEOs and we normally would have put up a trait like disagreeability as a more masculine trait because more CEOs are male. But successful female CEOs also tend to have a, a fairly high degree of disagreeability mm -hmm. in the way that they conduct business because they're out to also try and achieve some sort of top position, top status, something like that. So disagreeability isn't necessarily a masculine trait if both genders can benefit from a certain aspect of of disagreeability or or conquest you know for for whatever for whatever benefit so we should stop saying that that's a masculine trait we should stop saying like oh well if women just acted more like men then they'd be more successful mur, mur, mur. that's actually not the truth of our society from an evolutionary from an evolutionary standpoint and so, so oh, sorry, oh, no, I was going to say, but so this book coming from the perspective of 1969 still, I think, falls into some of the traps of of one, you know, expressing a lot of this from the perspective of a feminist in 1969 commenting on aspects of patriarchy. So there is some of the sense of that, some of the feeling in that and why this book was so progressive for it being so accessible to audiences of the time too. back in that sort of like golden age of science fiction where you could you could deal with some really heady 1960s political topics through you know crazy aliens and spaceships and laser blasters and robots and stuff um but when when we when we come back and we approach it from today it starts to feel a little bit like a grandparent telling you a story and you know like maybe they disconnect. say oriental instead of asian person and you're like right. no grandma you can't you can't say no. that well, oh, I, no. we don't I guess say well, that anymore. Well, on a certain level, it it in the the bare bones level, one thing that you can take away from it that is significant is when you strip away gender and uh, strip away those what you exactly what you're talking about are people still people. Yeah. And they are and and that's really the message of this book more than anything i found and in that sense that i agree with it it, it does it does hold up 
and it is significant and is definitely worth keeping is 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 worth keeping in our collective memories. Yeah, That's no, that I, that and, and that I feel were the parts of the book I appreciated the most is when we got that those little glimpses of insight into their culture beyond just the trappings of political intrigue were some of those discussions about their notion of spirituality, their version of like a Zen Buddhist mm -hmm. yin and you know, yang outlook and, and yin and yang and yeah. balance <laughs> and, and finding those those different elements and and how. The, the novelty of their characters commenting on the human condition from from their outside perspective of not understanding what it must be like to be one gender all the time were some of the most refreshing aspects of the conversation. I just mm -hmm. wish there were more of those. Yeah, because I feel like Agreed. if we had gotten just a bit more of that kind of insight earlier in the book, as opposed to this being sort of three very hard, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, three hard acts, you know, the first act in Carhide, the second act in, in Orgorian, and the third act, uh, their their travels in the tundra. Um, there, if there had been a little bit more room for that, that kind of philosophy, then I feel like the ideas expressed in this book would have been more accessible to a greater swath of modern audience. Agreed. Yeah, it's, yeah, they that beginning just they just throw you into it. And you're just, you know, <laughs> like and like and that can be yeah. fine that you know, be, being thrown directly into the trappings of a, of a fantasy story that can be fine but this flirts with some of that notion of like you need to learn elvish before you can fully understand this book yeah. but we're not going to teach it to you you know like yeah. it almost hits that kind of that kind of yeah. fantasy aspect where that compendium would have been helpful and i was i was desperately trying not to go and hit like the wikipedia or read because yeah. there's so much literature on this book it has been such a and, such a force the world behind it in, in, around the world that i didn't want to go into reading this book full of you know like philosophy thesis papers and you know literature uh, thesis papers written by college students telling me why I should have been impressed by the book. I kind of just wanted to accept it mm -hmm. on its own terms. And that's where I also felt like the book just wouldn't give me the terms of our relationship until <laughs> fairly late into the book. And, and like, you know, it felt like it was sort of withholding that from me a little yeah. bit. I, I, yeah, I was very, very similar experience on that, but you know, it's, it, it's, it is significant. It's just, it's not for the lighthearted. That's for, well, that's for certain. Yeah, that's 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 definitely uh, an aspect. If you want to, if you want to push yourself, I do recommend this because it it's it's something that I am I'm very thankful that I read and that I and I feel that I've grown having read it. Uh, I probably not. Gonna, I don't think I'm going to reread it anytime soon, though. <laughs> unfortunately I, well and and is because we've we've read numerous books that are that have been the the kickoff for series mm -hmm. um i'm 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 still looking to revisit the world of the three body problem i'm definitely going to mm. be jumping back into expanse because i need i need some laser blasters and spaceship you know adventure <laughs> sci-fi in yeah. my life i don't know that I, like I need to marinate on this book even a little bit long. I finished it over the weekend. I finished it about three or four mm -hmm. days ago, and I still need to kind of marinate on it a little bit more before I decide whether or not I want to return to this world. I, like you get to the end of a book like the gods themselves from Isaac Asimov. Mm -hmm. And I'm really happy that there was no intent on making that a series. Like it wasn't a yeah. bigger, a smaller part of a larger universe. It's this one off, very strange story from Isaac Asimov that I don't know that he was fully equipped to di to dig into you know the differences in culture and society and aberrant sexuality like you know not the guy who writes robot story logic puzzles like oh the first rule of robotics you know, like oh well how do we mate now we have three of us here um didn't really seem to be his bag but it's it's an interesting read and i'm glad i read it but like there there's no pressure to continue on in this universe whereas here with ursula k Le Guin, there are other worlds it's the hanish novels is that mm -hmm. what yeah, it was the Hainish universe, essentially. Yes. Um, oh gosh, I don't have the wiki. I don't have the wiki up um, right now. It has the other novels in there, but yes, they're all part of a series. This is the first one in the series, but the, like part of it too is she only 
gives hints into the wider universe and and uh, not chronology, but just kind of the the continuity. She gives hints of it in her books, as I understand it, as as they go along. So, so this is definitely where I feel like her writing style and my fandom are just not quite in sync because there are aspects of of that that I care very much about as a consumer of science fiction mm. fun. Um, I want to know what is the time period of this novel if it's supposed to take place in our universe? Like, you don't have the conceit right. of this being Star Wars. And yet, we never really get it clear. Is this 500 years in Earth's future? Is it a 1,000 years in Earth's future? Does mm -hmm. Earth still exist? It does? Right. Okay, the well, in what fashion is it like... Well, they call it Terra. Well, yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no anchor in this. Right. And like, at least with Dune, there is a slight anchor, sort of. Does go to, I mean, like, again, I just need the one paragraph of exposition that lets me know where in the universe and when in the universe I am. And it's mm -hmm. those little aspects of, I mean, they're, they're the tropes of science fiction. Is this mm -hmm. a universe far, far away that it has no relationship to the world that we exist in? Or is it 100 years in the future? Is it Star Trek 400 years in the future? Where, where am I? And those are the parts of science fiction storytelling that I really get the sense Ursula K. Le Guin just doesn't have as much interest in digging into that kind of detail or nuance. Like, that's not what gets mm -hmm. her off in like telling a story. It's much more like fantasy in that sense, where you know you don't you don't need that connection uh, back, you know, where mm -hmm. you're not you're not at, you know if you're, uh, you know if you're going to end up reading, uh, gosh, a Dungeons and Dragons novel, you know, or like a Drist Deward, <laughs> not you know, like Dark Elf trilogy, you're not really wondering how does this relate to to the world I live in now, you know, like yeah. you, they aren't concerned with that. So, and then one, I think that that shows her fantasy her fantasy strengths, but for my personal satisfaction, it didn't really line up as well. Yeah. I, th I think I, that's another aspect that I, I had a little difficulty with, especially in, in just the changing perspective of authorship or, or of, of narrative to of the, when different characters speak, I don't know that we necessarily need to rehash that too much, but there is a moment, like, I don't know how you felt right at the beginning of chapter five, she goes on like a two page description of someone describing something to Jen Lee I. And at the end of that, or I guess it's like a page and a half at the end of that page and a half, she literally writes and so on and so on. And <laughs> yes, you're like, I know. I was, you're like, like what? I know. You I, made I me was read like, a whole page of nonsense yeah. to then know, experience like, that Jen Lee I also went like, meh. Oh, this person's just rambling. I, I, I was really like actually ramble. I was wondering if somebody just like written that in on my copy of the book. Uh, and I'm like, oh, no, that's printed. Okay. <laughs> like, no. I, I don't know what to make of this. Oh my gosh. So okay, confusion. this 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 was this was definitely our our month of of eating the vegetables. Um <laughs> God, because there are so many amazing ideas uh -huh. in this novel, and it really will make you question sort of the trappings of science fiction. And just like with the three yeah. body problem, I love I love those stories that that help us examine the human condition. And again, from Ursula K. Le Guin's conceit at the very beginning, the preface of her novel, I love those stories that help us examine the human condition as it exists today with the spoonful of sugar of it being set on another planet or in the future or in AI or with fuzzy teddy bears that can knock down Imperial stormtroopers. Like <laughs> whatever it is that we need to get over examining our culture whatever conceit if it's fantasy if it's sci-fi if it's rubber forehead prosthetics or you know black makeup on one side of the face and white mm. makeup on the other you know if that's how we need to talk about racism then let's do it i mean frank gorshin's a badass um but but this this book comes with some of the baggage of the 1960s that i'm not a child of and i'm not a member mm. of and i feel like the most successful novels, the most successful stories of classic science fiction eras 
feel timeless, but then also probably didn't do the best job of examining the human condition, or at least not in the way that we hold up these authors, like an Arthur C. Clarke, right? Yeah. A, a 2001, A Space Odyssey still feels modern enough in the way that it was sent in, set in close to a present day world that we understand, asks really heady and philosophical questions in a very roundabout and obtuse way that help us just kind of get into an adventure story with a little background noise about how we feel about AI or creation mm -hmm. or life. Um, this book being a much harder examination, examination of the social condition as it pertains to the 1960s means that it's more a product of its time and that it seems to stay there more than a book that might sort of feel more timeless. Again, I would maybe also yeah. put it the comparison of a book like 2001 A Space Odyssey against Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood End. Um, Childhood oh, End yeah. is a book that I absolutely adore as an examination of the evolution of the human species into something else. And yet everyone that I've given this book to to read thinks it's like the most depressing novel ever. Because <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like, but humans die at the end. And you're like, yes, but no. Oh, yeah. that's not what happens. And you're like, for me, it's just like this beautiful transcendent moment. And everyone else is like, why the fuck do you make me read this shit? <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, it's yeah, it it is something and it's and it's it's definitely significant to, but yes, it's it's uh, you know, I'm just be, it's up to you now to just to write to write the the modernized version, you know. <laughs> I I wouldn't I wouldn't dare to condescend to an audience that I could <laughs> examine these types of uh, storytelling devices in a meaningful way for other people. Like I, I I'm, I'm too sort of gender normative. <laughs> there are people that, so, and, and again, do you, do you think that today in the conversations that we're having between the different like gay and lesbian communities, transgender communities, and sort of the more gender fluid communities that are also trying to eschew labels, you know, like as, just as much as there's a push towards, you know, like everything has to be put into its tidy little box so that everyone can mm -hmm. feel special. There are also those people who are like, well, I don't ascribe to any sort of, you know, sort of gender dynamic that's recognized in this dichotomy, but I'm also not those people. And maybe I'm just right. not labelable. Um, mm -hmm. Will we see the science fiction story arise out of this condition that becomes something of a classic to help explain this day and age to a future audience like i get a very good sense of 1960s politics when i go back and i read stories like these some of them more successful as entertainment some of them more successful as time capsules of their era but you get the sense of just how how expressive and how vibrant and how how much conflict there was in the social structure of the 1960s. Oh, yeah. I wonder well, what, oh. what will rise to the occasion in a world where, you know, billions of dollars of consumerism is spent on the next comic book adaptation film. Is there going to be that mm -hmm. novel that rises out of this culture to stand the test of time? Well, yeah, I mean, gosh, with, with, Part of it also is going to depend too on how our current our current socio political climate ends up too. You know how it concludes <laughs> or develops. Yeah. You know, so but I mean I think there's definitely room for it. I'm I'm looking forward to read it whenever <laughs> whenever yeah. it comes around. So. Well, that's the thing is like I think if I had been growing up in the '60s, I would have missed Ursula K. Le Guin entirely. I would have been up my own butt about Bradbury, Clark, um, Heinlein, Asimov. Mm -hmm. Like those would have been my dudes. Those would have been my bros, right? Um, I think I would have missed this. And so you know, now I also have that same fear and that same uh, sense of trepidation. Like because I love my robots and spaceships and blasters, am I missing that great time capsule of a novel which – which really does speak to the human condition of 2018. Yeah, it's yeah. Well, I guess we'll see. It's I'm excited for the prospect of it. Just hope we just have to both keep our eyes out for it then. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> and but, uh, we'll, we'll definitely cover it on this show, even though we might not even know that that's what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what? Who yeah. knew that the book that was going to sum up North American culture in the early 2000s was Little Brother? Oh my gosh, we were yeah. so on it. What? <laughs> I will say, probably, I will say also, one thing that also might have affected a little bit of, of our initial impressions of this book too was coming from a young adult novel like Little Brother. Yeah. Coming to something it's a really <laughs> easy read. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. I was. Uh, I started reading this and I was just going, I had to like completely re readjust how I was. I felt the out book. of shape. I felt like, yes! <laughs> like my brain was too weak to handle the words. <laughs> it was so, bad. so um, we should probably start wrapping this up. We oh, did yeah. have, we did have some fun comments in the chat from Aruki to you. Cumbersome is a nice way of putting this book early on in our discussion. Just, that was a word that I kept kind of coming back to. Um, Fernanda Frando 99 saying, who's the other guy? And the other guy oh. here is Andrew Wallace, my very good friend. So, yeah. You know, and a lot of people just chiming in. We've got Venno stuff. Good morning from Finland. And Met D. Oh, nice. uh, hey, Juan, I really appreciate your viewpoint from listening to the Pocket Now podcast. Where do you find the time to read? As I've gathered that you're quite the busy guy. And it's like, this, this is our, this is my sanity time. I don't know about you, Andrew, but it's like, I've gotten into the bad habit of needing a book to fall asleep. Like, mm. So that's not good. Like I can't marathon read because now I've gotten into that habit of, well, I'll relax with a good book. And when I'm relaxed, I'll fall asleep. I know. Well, you know, yeah. Like I have to have like a little a bookmark that I can kind of like secure <laughs> that yeah. way in case I kind of like, you know, uh. yeah. But you know, my, my favorite time to read is, is on the weekends in the morning. If I can just, yeah. Uh, that know. was my favorite time to read, but then I, right. you know, toddler life is uh, very aggressive. Yeah. That I know that'll change for me someday, you know, <laughs> I'm sure. So yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's important to make the time to read just because yeah. it, it exercises that part of, you know, a part of your brain that you won't really. Won't well, grow. And how can you be snobby about new TV shows and movies if you didn't read and like the book better first? Mm hmm. <laughs> right. The Expanse TV show is very good and it's totally scratching my itch for like a good hard sci fi action Battlestar Galactica kind of show. Mm -hmm. The book's better though. Yep. Looks a better story. And, the, and the authors are even helping with the show and the book's better. But that's that's also, you know, like the, the brilliance of like a really well structured story that the audience is a contributor to. I'm not being told what the important aspects of the story are, I get to decide what I felt mm -hmm. was an important aspect of the story. And for as amazing as the cast in The Expanse is, I still think they got Miller not quite right, even though yeah. Thomas Jane is awesome. He's awesome. He's great. He's so much fun, and he's having so much fun in that role. It's nothing to take away from him, but, you know, like someone else would have been better. <laughs> well, you know, speak, speaking of uh, of books that are going to be ad adapted into into uh, so TV we, series, we set our schedule three months out just so that Andrew and I can kind of talk and coordinate. Um, some someone was asking uh, Juan Salazar, like, do we write notes about the book while we're reading it? And and I I don't feel like Andrew's really good about this. I'm not as good about putting together like a Google Doc and really bullet pointing different notes. But like we're both kind of creating a little mini book report. Like I've got like scribbles on a notepad by the side of my bed just so that <laughs> yeah. I can kind of keep <laughs> important talking points in mind. Um, but we do set out our our, our plan a, a little ways out, and f like two books in a row, we were ahead of a trend that we wouldn't have guessed. So un unfortunately, the, the one for this month was the, the, the passing of Ursula K. Le Guin. Oh, no. and I, <laughs> I have such a bad, bad track record too, because, because, and I've told Juan this about how, when, when I was in high school, I, I uh, did a book review of Band of Brothers and Stephen Ambrose died the day that I presented. I didn't ask for this power, apparently. Uh, you know, so. Andrew, I think it's just worth reiterating. With this power comes great responsibility. I and, guess. Um, I, I would expect you to exercise that responsibility uh, with with compassion uh, <laughs> yes. and um, 
if I, we need I, to start reading authors from you know, people we don't like. <laughs> or, or ones who have already passed, you know, yeah. the same way. <laughs> so then that way, no one, no one's been sacrificed like, and made. You picked the book. The author's been dead for 50 years, and now the dead are rising from the grave. What'd you oh, do, no. Andrew? <laughs> What'd you do? Um, but no, not, nothing nothing quite so dire for next month's book. Um, it, talking about different adaptations, we had it on our calendar before the official announcement for the release date of Altered Carbon. Altered Carbon is going to be our next book. Mine's in the mail. Mine will be coming in the next couple of days. And uh, that's our February book. We'll have the date of the broadcast uh, set. Uh, Andrew and I just need to kind of check our schedules. Mm -hmm. But then if you check in on this video, on the podcast links, or on the Some Gadget Guy website, uh, we'll Facebook. have all of the details. Oh, and the Facebook. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have the Facebook. We've got a Geek Book Club Twitter. We've got a Geek Book Club Instagram. Um, which Andrew's been doing a phenomenal job of filling with some really cool photos from from uh, you know mom and pop bookshops uh, around his area, and eventually I will also get on board contributing to the photography <laughs> of the Geek Book Club Instagram. I apologize; it's been a little busy because uh, one of the other initiatives that I'm taking in on this channel is launching a Patreon. Uh, Patreon just to help production in general on the Some Gadget Guy YouTube account and the Some Gadget Guy website. And one of the things that I want to make sure we're able to to grow and improve upon is the Geek Book Club, and uh, producing some new some additional content for this uh, for this program as well. Getting into uh, interviews, we want to start talking to different authors, to writers, people who are producing screenplays, uh, adaptations, and just what the the creative process might look like so while this podcast is only once a month um i'm hoping that we can expand into bi-weekly or maybe even weekly content if this starts to find a little more traction or a little bit bigger audience and so we uh, we thank you guys who were early supporters on board yeah. and talking about the show and sharing the show and hitting that rss subscription feed because uh we we do have plans for the growth of this of this broadcast and some of the fun things that we can do in talking about our favorite our favorite stories and uh, our favorite genres. Yeah, it's yeah. We thank thank you guys for who's stuck with us all this time because you know it's we wouldn't we wouldn't be here without your guys' love, you know, and and uh, enjoyment from what we what we produce out here, especially for a podcast that's once a month. You're like that's right, actually kind exactly. of a big ask too, is just to remember that we exist. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> so book for February, Altered Carbon, uh, soon to be a, it's Netflix, right? It's going to be a Netflix mm -hmm. series. Yes. Yes. Uh, and it's going to actually, I think it's going to be, it's going to, that's going to be out in February, right? Yeah. Let me see. Uh... What's the premiere? Oh, the premiere is February 2nd. Oh, oh, well, there yeah. we go. I am not so going to watch it. Before I've read the book, though, I so will I can be properly also hipster. go radio silence. But that also means I, I, you know, the F need to really chew through this book because yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yes. So that's going to do it for this month's Geek Book Club. Uh, as always, we just want to throw that shout out to not only can you support the show, you know, we've got the Patreon. There is also a link down below each of our episodes on the YouTube and on the blog posts for uh, an Audible subscription. If that's up your alley, you can definitely check that out too. Sharing the show is always appreciated, but then also taking some time to support uh, community initiatives in your area. Support your local libraries. Uh, mm -hmm. Use your local libraries. You know, instead of maybe buying some of these books, you know, actually in, you know, utilize what your taxes have invested in. Uh, in mm -hmm. providing you an amazing resource in your community for finding books and other pieces of media as an archive too for how we can uh, we can protect content produced over time. So uh, always a shout out there. You can catch the Geek Book Club around the web. Like I said, the Geek Book Club on Twitter and Instagram. We have a Facebook page and then the the appropriate links on the Some Gadget Guy YouTube channel and blog. And then you can find uh, Andrew and I if you just want to kind of get into a one-on-one -on -one conversation individually where Andrew is at Fat Produce and I am at Some Gadget Guy and neither of us had working lower thirds yeah. for YouTube this week. So we're even. Ow. And Stevens. No, no, I still got mine. So oh, it's you, running joke. Sure. I have this every time. Pretty well, much. whenever you feel like you want to make me a super nice paper lower third for me to that, that'd be fine. You just send <laughs> oh, it. Oh yeah. Way. Just got ship it. it right over. I'll print it out. <laughs> 
Uh, thanks so much for watching, folks. We're going to be back next month with another great read, Altered Carbon. I hope you'll read the book ahead of time, then join us in uh, in the chat, the conversation. And uh, oh, what's the email address if you want to leave us uh, a message post show? Is it the oh, Geek Book Club at it's Gmail? At the Geek Book Club at Gmail .com. So you can also join the conversation there too. We're 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 all around. You can find us around the internet. We're we're on. The internet so folks again thanks so much for watching on behalf of andrew and myself we uh we love getting into these conversations and we hope you enjoy them too and we will catch you next month with altered carbon see you guys <laughs>